The US military units are broken down into three different tiers. Tiers 1, 2, and 3. Tier 3 units, also known as white elements, consist of entities such as the US Army's 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, Marine Corps Recon Battalions, Navy Riverines, Air Force 142nd Fighter Wing, etc. Tier 2 units, also known as gray elements, consist of entities such as the Navy SEALs, Navy SWIX, Marine Raiders, Air Force Combat Controllers, PJs, Army Rangers, Army Special Forces, Night Stalkers, etc. Tier 1 units, also known as Black Elements, consist of Delta Force, Dev Crew, 24th Special Tactics Squadron, Intelligence Support Activity, and the Regimental Reconnaissance Company. But what makes these units different? Why the different tiers? What's the difference between a Tier 1 and Tier 2 unit? We're here to answer those questions. If you want to know more about the three different tiers of the United States military, sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Before we dive in, we do have to say that outside of the Tier 1 units, military units don't really refer to themselves by their numbered tier. You don't see Navy SEALs or Army Rangers referring to themselves as Tier 2 units, nor would you ever catch the 82nd Airborne calling themselves a Tier 3 unit. The tier system is generally an unsaid or unwritten way of organizing or marginalizing military units. In fact, you'll hardly ever see the use of these terms outside of the 5 Tier 1 units that exist, and even then, you hardly hear about those either due to the nature of their classified missions and purposes. You might be surprised to find this out, but the different tiers generally have to do with funding. And it goes even deeper than that, too. It has to do with funding per capita, or per person. In scenario one, if you give a team of 100 people $100 million, that's a million dollars a piece to gear them up for operations and missions. However, in scenario two, if you give 10,000 people $100 million, that's only $10,000 a piece for each person. And you can do the math there. Scenario one's people will have some gnarly gear, and Scenario 2's people will have hand-me-downs in comparison. You've probably heard the saying, follow the money. Following the money works the same way in the military. Tier 1 units get the most money, which in turn gets them the best gear, resources, and the best people to work in the units. While funding may be the main difference between the tiers, another difference is the level of skills and training. A tier 1 operator is going to be more trained up and capable of doing a lot more than someone from a tier 3 unit. The tier 1 operator most likely has several years in deployments under their belt with a tier 2 soft unit, making them the tip of the spear when it comes to being an operator. There is a clear distinction in training and capabilities when you look at a tier 1 unit versus a tier 3 unit. Take, for example, a Marine Marine infantrymen or army infantrymen. They're no special operator, but they know how to fight, and depending on the experience of the individual, they may have a lot of combat experience. Some infantrymen can even become snipers, go to ranger school, and they still have plenty of fulfilling career opportunities if the stars align for them. Compare these guys to a Delta Force operator though, which could very well be a Green Beret with years and years of experience, going through multiple strict selection processes, and we're sure you can see the difference. But the lines are blurred a little bit when you compare Tier 1 to Tier 2. Tier 2 soft operators are still highly capable warriors in the battlefield, and should not be mistaken to be completely inferior to every aspect of a Tier 1 operator. Tiers 1 and 2 have a lot of overlap in their skill sets. To elaborate a bit more, Tier 1 units, like Delta Force and DevGru, typically pull from the best of the best of the Tier 2 units, such as the Green Berets, Rangers, and SEALs. While it can be argued that Tier 1 units are more capable and equipped than Tier 2 units, they can't just be boiled down to being better. They have a more intense mission set, they have different objectives, and they serve different purposes. So a quick recap before we move on. Tier 1 units compose of the best of the best of the Tier 2 units, Tier 2 units consist of soft operators from your typical soft units, and then Tier 3 units are considered as large and conventional warfare units. Now that you have a basic grasp and understanding of the three tiers, you're probably asking, do you have to move up the tier system? Do you have to go from Tier 3 to Tier 2 to Tier 1? Not really. You could very well find yourself in a Tier 3 unit, try out for a soft force and be in a Tier 2 unit, and then further down your career find yourself in a Tier 1 unit. Unit. You could join off the bat into a tier 2 unit and make your way into a tier 1 unit, or you could jump from a tier 3 unit into a tier 1 unit. 
Delta Force has been known to take personnel from conventional forces on rare occasions. As a matter of rule, however, you typically need extensive experience in a Tier 2 soft unit before you're able to try out or be recruited into a Tier 1 unit. You really only see people getting recruited straight into a Tier 1 unit in the movies, so don't think that SEAL Team 6 is going to come knocking on your door because you're interested. What is true, however, is that it is much easier to join a Tier 3 unit as compared to a Tier 2 unit. Tier 3 unit selection process aren't as grueling as Tier 2 units are, because Tier 3 units need the people, and they are different entities with different goals altogether. While at the end of the day, any unit will want and need people who are qualified and able to do the job, Navy SEALs aren't looking for numbers like the 101st Airborne Division is. A shared component of the three tiers is their need and use of support personnel. While support personnel might not be doing the coolest job out there, they are a necessity and highly relied on. SEALs couldn't get the job done without their support personnel just as much as Delta Force or MARSOC can't. Not everyone can be an operator, but operators can't do everything. Support personnel can be pulled from conventional forces into roles for Tiers 1, 2, and even 3. While the roles and specific jobs of support personnel widely vary, they typically boil down to areas such as logistics, maintenance, and administration. But there's plenty of other ones, such as EOD Techs for MARSOC and DevGuru. So, if you're interested in working with one of these elite units, but you're not interested in being an operator, there's a role you can play. Operators aren't any better than their support personnel. Again, it all comes down to a different purpose. With that said, we've done plenty of videos discussing Tier 1 and Tier 2 units. On screen are the videos we've done on the Tier 1 units. Now, on screen are the Tier 2 units. As you can see, we've covered a lot on this channel. Go give them a look. The learning never stops at General Discharge. And before you go, we've partnered with a few businesses to give you some decent discounts on a variety of products. On screen are all of the companies we've partnered with thus far. The links to them will be in the description below if you want to check them out. Well, that is the down and dirty of the three different tiers of units in the United States military. If you learned something from this video, make sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. As always, thank you for watching. Do you even want to be here? A big shout out to all of our YouTube members and our patrons over at our Patreon. Thank you all so much for taking the extra step in supporting our channel. It is much appreciated. If you'd like to be featured on a general discharge video, consider joining our membership with the link in the description or the join button to the left of the subscribe button, or go give our Patreon a look and join the team. Here's Nick Nausea. All your friends are subscribing to general discharge and you don't even want to be here.